Um, well, good afternoon and welcome to the inaugural session of the Dr. Noemi Marin Lecture Series. Um, uh, Dr. Mills asked me to just say a few words about Noemi, and I could say a lot of things, but I, I cut it down to really short. Um, I had the great pleasure of working with Noemi for a number of years, and along with good food and wine, we also shared a love for rhetoric, democracy, and exploration of the relationships between those two things. And Dr. Marin was also very passionate about thoughtful, meaningful, and relevant scholarship. And she contributed greatly to the scholarly reputation of the SCMS. So when I heard about this series, that's her name, under her name, it seems to me that it is the most apt way that we as a school can celebrate her life and honor her work and honor the way that she impacted in a long-term fashion, her students, her colleagues, her school, her college, and her academic career, her academic discipline. And I think that today we have the most appropriate person to be the speaker for the first lecture in this series. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mulvaney. So we could not have a more perfect speaker for this inaugural lecture. In fact, Dr. Bogdan Stefanescu is here because he and Noemi had a long time collegial relationship. He is also like Noemi from Romania. Uh, Dr. Stefanescu is a professor of English at the University of Bucharest, a fellow of the New, uh, New Europe College, a, and a grantee of the British Council of the University of London, the University of Stuttgart, and the European Commission. So incredibly well-regarded scholar. He's here with SCMS this semester as a Fulbright visiting scholar, and his research focuses on literary and cultural studies and on discourse and translation, and most recently with comparative study of nationalism and post-colonial and post-communist cultures. And for those, those of us who knew Dr. Marin, those were topics that were very near and dear to her heart and central to her scholarship. So without further ado, I would like to, rec uh, to recognize and to turn the floor over to Dr. Bogdan Stefanescu, who will be talking about To Fall on Your Two-Edged Sword. You can see the word play there with sword and word. Uh, political humor as resistance against the abuse of power in Eastern Europe and the Romanian example. If you are in Zoom, please mute. This is also being recorded. And at the end, we will give you an opportunity to put questions in chat. And then we will give you an opportunity to ask those questions as well as questions from the room. If you can't see on Zoom, this is quite a full house. So thank you and welcome Dr. Stefanescu. Um, I mean, I'm incredibly honored and, and you've created such a pressure for the presentation. I hope I'm not letting anyone down. Um, but um, it's it's wonderful to be here uh, to be welcomed by you so so warmly, and um, of course I'm I'm here at the invitation of Noemi, so a long time friend of academic mischief, and um, I I tell people that I wonder if I'm not her her last at least half completed project because we're supposed to be here together and work on a couple of topics. Uh, fortunately, that's not the case now. Um, so I, I'd like to, um, to start by saying that perhaps, perhaps it may look, feel unseemly to dwell on humor at this time when we're still um, saddened by an enemy's tragic departure just a few months ago. Um, but those of us who were lucky enough to know her can tell that she would have loved this so much. And uh, if there's one memory uh, that outshines all for me, it's her sense of humor and her delightful teenage uh, laughter, her bubbly laughter and her enjoyment of humor. So she would have relished uh, to be able to discuss humor uh, on such an occasion. 
Um, so I have no qualms to dedicate this to the members of my um, Now, could, could I ask your permission to sit while I talk to you about that? I hope that wouldn't offend anyone. This is going to be easier to absorb yeah. with the computer and everything else. Thank you for your understanding. Okay. Now, the the laughter that uh, I'll be talking about today is not necessarily a happy one. It's not one of contentment. Um, people in my part of the world, which is Eastern Europe, have learned to live mostly with uh, a heavy soul, even when they're have, having a great time. Uh, there's a lot of frustration historically accumulated part of the world. And it just, it's not just because of the difference in first standards of living uh, that we have there, but um, because their human dignity and uh, their aspirations have constantly been trampled by political regimes before, during, and even after Congress. We've had fascist dictatorships, we've had communist totalitarianism, and we have a fledgling post-communist democracy where the ruling politicians, left, right, and center, um, wants to take illiberal measures. That is, if they're not downright dictators. Putin. Um, in, in recent years, Poland and Hungary, once the prized countries of Eastern Europe, backslid from democratic ideals and values, um, and they received stinging uh, sanctions from the European Union, plus a slap on the wrist from the US, in the case of Hungary. Her, Victor Orban's and Cahoots. Now, Romania is not commonly uh, listed as one of the bad boys in Eastern Europe, uh, although it's not very far from that profile. Um, it is run by what we call a kleptocracy, um, a, a predatory elite by corruption, by clientelism and nepotism. Um, these things are endemic. Things. Um, politicians are trying to subdue the media and the justice system constantly, and dignitaries are kept immune from prosecution. So what is the popular reaction to that? Well, a poll in uh, May 2023 showed that more than 80% of Romanians distrust the country's leaders. The 2020 parliamentary elections only managed to rally 32% of voters. So there's a percentage. Um, most Romanians just gave up. Um, they're treating politics with contempt. Uh, and that's because for decades, they have experienced being ruled by corruption and incompetence, by public lying, shameful, and shameless public lying, um, and demagoguery. Occasionally, however, there is some civic mobilization in Romania. And it's not just for wages, for better living conditions, conditions. There is a more principled criticism coming, usually from younger, urban, educated people who can make clever use of the social media. And I'm going to give you one example. On a, a winter night in early 2017, behind closed doors, the government passed a law which was practically decriminalizing embezzlement and corruption. 
people found out soon and were outraged. And there was a public campaign that started in social media and it ended up in the streets. This most remarkable form of expression was a flood of mockery um, and witticisms that were directed at the corrupt political elite. Um, people would be uh, punning on the names of these corrupt politicians. Um, the leader of the uh, ruling party was Livio Dragnet, Livio Dragnet. So one of the slogans was, we don't believe you, <laughs> spelled with the name of the uh, character. <laughs> Um, they would use, in, in the rallies, uh, they would use their children and even their dogs to carry little signs, funny signs, uh, showing their opposition to, to the government and to the shame, shameless lying, um, corruption. Um, the ruling party tried to counterattack by spreading slanders that demonstrators were on George Soros's pay, um, the payroll. What did the protesters do? Ironically, they embraced this calumny and they even paraded in the streets with signs that read, for instance, hey, Soros, if you're seeing this, what happened to the money? What happened to me? Uh, or stuff like that. Taurus, you, you need to consider giving me uh, a bonus for, for strenuous working conditions because I'm here in the winter yeah, and the freezing cold. Um, okay, so this shows that the um, protesters of February 2017 acted on the belief that, so to speak, levity is the soul of wit but also that wit is the soul of political action. Now, whether they were right, is still a matter of debate. Following this massive protest, uh, the law was indeed withdrawn. The Minister of Justice stepped down, but only to be anointed president of a parliament's legislative council, which is a uh, an office that he holds for life. There is no term for that. Uh, so it was, it was rewarded for his service. Eventually, the head of the ruling party did go to prison, though it wasn't a direct result of the protests. However, the government was not toppled. The ruling party did not lose the next elections. Um, corruption still runs rampant in the country. Politicians are still acting with impunity and in cynical disregard of public opinion. So this presses the question, or actually a series of questions. Is humor a relevant weapon against the abuse of power? Is wit enough? to stand against tyranny. And what is the better way to strike at an illiberal government? <laughs> Jokes, jibes, or substantive rallies and direct political involvement? Could I use this for a second? Uh, let's see. That's that's the rally. Yeah, some thirty three hundred thousand people were gathered in front of the government building. Uh, and that's me and my wife uh, <laughs> participating in the rally in the in the cold winter. Um, so the question, another question would be, would the law have been withdrawn if people had not flooded the square in front of the government building? by the hundreds of thousands. So I am going to suggest uh, that in order to try and 
find answers to all these questions, perhaps it would be a good idea to go back a bit and see how humor worked under communist totalitarianism in Romania. Um, so maybe we can uh, <clears throat> somehow glimpse at the mechanisms of humor against uh, political power and, and apply it to today, to what happens today, not just in Eastern Europe, but all over the world, maybe even here in the United States. Um, now, here are uh, two jokes that I'm going to start with, two political jokes that were quite popular during communist totalitarianism in Eastern Europe. They illustrate two different types for me of political humor that I will be speaking about today. And the difference will hopefully become clearer um, as we move along with this presentation. This is the first one. Can you build communism in Switzerland? Of course you can, but what a pity that would be. <laughs> That's one. The other joke, is this one. Under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's just the other way around. <laughs> um, so how exactly does humor work under communism? And how do you explain the, the way these jokes um, function? How, how, what is their role? As far as I can tell, there, there are two frequently invoked. Out of the many, there are two the most frequently invoked functions of political humor under such totalitarian regimes. And the first one is relief. Humor offers relief. Now, these would be the theories of, for instance, um, Lord Chaffery or John Dewey, Herbert Spencer, Sigmund Freud. Okay, so... Um, Humor offering release, liberation. It could be from the enormous psychological tension that people accumulate under communism and totalitarian society. Um, but it could also be providing uh, a relief from in a spiritual or even ideological liberation because it helps you crit critically distance yourself from political dogmas, such as Here's an interesting uh, and telling example, an illustration from Lord Shaftesbury, um, who says, and thus the natural free spirits of ingenious men, if imprisoned and controlled, will find out other ways of motion to relieve themselves in their constraints. And whether it be in burlesque, mimicry, or buffoonery, they will be glad at any rate to vent themselves and be revenged on their constrainers. So no, no matter what kind of relief you're talking about, psychological, ideological, physiological even for laughter, um, it all seems to work by this principle from Lord Shaftesbury, which is the greater the weight is, the bitter will be the satire. The higher the slavery, the more exquisite the buffooner. The other popular theory on the function of political humor um, is that humor is a form of resistance to political oppression and repression, uh, a, a weapon of for dissidents and opposition. Uh, and this was intimated by uh, Alexander Pope uh, in his epilogue to the satires where he says, yes, I am proud. I must be proud to see men not afraid of God, afraid of me. Safe from the bar, the pulpit and the throne, 
yet touched and shamed by ridicule alone. O oh, sacred weapon left for truth defense, soul dread of folly, vice, and insolence. Now this uh, view blends with an, uh, one other theory of political humor and humor in general, uh, critical humor, the, the so-called superiority theory, uh, proposed by Thomas Hobbes. And you can see uh, on the bottom of the screen, uh, the quote from Hobbes that talks about this sudden glory, this self-congratulating uh, attitude of people comparing themselves uh, to the deformity and unseemliness of uh, politicians, for instance. <clears throat> laughter it says laughter is nothing else but a sudden glory arising from some sudden conception of some eminency in ourselves by comparison with the infirmity of others or with our own former life. And indeed, under the totalitarian regime, communism, humor became, as Václav Havel uh, put it, uh, the power of the powerless. When they laughed at um, the expense of the mighty, regular people felt intellectually and morally superior. And this worked as a symbolic toppling of the social hierarchy as well. Or as Orwell put it, every joke is a tiny revolution. Now, um, when you use it like that, humor takes on the hue of satire and operates in the rhetorical mode of sarcasm. This kind of humor is meant to be devastating, biting. After all, sarcasm comes from the Greek words, sarcasm, tearing the flesh, biting the lips. The uh, mechanism that worked there is rather straightforward. The meaning produced by this kind of antagonistic humor is unequivocal. The target is always clear. Uh, and in the case of communism, that was the target. Communism was directly um, targeted by this kind of humor. Those who jeered at communism were voicing their incompatibility with totalitarian power, and their opposition was irreducible. Now, it's probably time for a few examples of such jokes um, that employ sarcasm to satirize communism. Here's one against the Soviet so-called liberation, really an occupation. Are Russians friends or brothers? Well, they're brothers, of course, because friends you can choose. <laughs> or against economic deprivation. I hear there will be snow tomorrow. <laughs> so what? I'm not queuing for that, too. <laughs> Obviously, they know that uh, there was an economy of scarcity in Europe. Communists couldn't find it. Um, or against the lack of free choices. When was the first Russian election? When God put Eve in front of Adam and said, go ahead, choose your way. <laughs> <laughs> or against idiots who would pass for enlightened rulers. Yeah, and take the example of the uh, Romanian dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu. Supposedly, he was one night fretting in bed, and his wife, Elena, he was just as stupid, but she was uh, delegated to take care of science and culture and education. And she was promoted wildly beyond, far beyond her abilities, and even made a member of the Romanian Academy, right? So the wife says, um, what is it? And, and Nikolai just replies, I, I read in the papers today about the law of gravity. But when did we ever pass that law? <laughs> uh, and she replies, the uh, yeah, member of Academy, I don't know anything about that. Oh my God. You know that I'm a world-renowned scientist. I'm above politics. <laughs> <laughs> or the other example, Brezhnev, the Russian uh, president, president of the Soviet Union, reads his speech at the Moscow Olympic Games. Oh, 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 oh. 
No, comrades, his assistant whispered. That's just the Olympic logo. Oh. Huh? <laughs> so this, this kind of sarcastic humor separates very clearly the rulers from the rules. These are all opposite incompatible camps. The uh, languages and the political views are also entirely disconnected. They even belong to different separate, totally separate social spaces, official discourse, but a monopoly on public space, while political jokes like these could only be shared secretly in a private space. And even then, you had to be extremely cautious, because you never knew. It's another famous joke. Uh, how do all Soviet jokes start? By looking over your shoulder. <laughs> um, so as a result, sarcastic, offensive humor may have helped because only possible in a private space and with your close family and friends um, may have worked to help us cope with totalitarianism, but because it was so cloistered, it could do little to mobilize people, mobilize the population for mass protests against uh, communism. It's probably uh, different in a, in a democracy where you can actually engage in this kind of humor publicly, openly, and that would help mobilize people to action. Um, what, what may happen though, when you use this kind of humor under totalitarian regimes, is a more discrete form of resistance and liberation. And I'm gonna um, resort to something that uh, cultural anthropologist, uh, James T. Scott, said uh, his books, you know, one of, uh, one of them is Domination in the Arts of Resistance. He looked at how subordinate groups cope with oppressive social and political environments. And he showed how they resist this kind of power in a silent, secret, unspectacular way through, by means of clandestine discourse. An encoded, if you will, type of discourse. He called it the hidden transcript. Um, and more interestingly, Scott also suggests that the oppressed will not use just one language, like, for instance, this encoded language of resistance or the official language that was available in public space. He says, Let's look at the quotes. Work? Yeah. Most of the political life of subordinate groups is to be found neither in overt collective defiance of power holders nor in complete hegemonic compliance, but in the vast territory between these two polar opposites. Exactly can this work? when you have an intolerant society, with a warlike mentality, you're either with us or against us. Um, now Scott suggests there are many false strategies by which subordinate groups manage to insinuate their resistance in disguised forms into the public transcript, into the public discourse, that is. For Scott, such strategies include rumor, gossip, disguise, anonymity, linguistic tricks, metaphors, euphemism, folk tales, ritual gesture, carnivals. And at one point, he even mentions jokes, although strangely enough, he doesn't go into analyzing how they work. But still, Scott's observation that this hidden oppositional discourse infiltrates the public space comes very handy when you look at communism. Scott himself invokes some examples from uh, Eastern Europe under communism. And he quotes 
anti-communist writers like Milan Kundera, Milovan Gilas, Václav Pavel. Uh, for instance, Scott, Scott illustrates this kind of oblique resistance with a story from Kunder. Political prisoners in a Czech penal battalion were forced to compete in a fake race against the camp guards, a race they were expected to lose anyway. Um, so what they did was they put on this obvious mock uh, performance uh, and they exaggerated how hard they were trying to win the race when in fact they were barely making any headway. Um, in another example, Scott mentions one peculiar way in which people in Poland indicated their support for the Solidarność which was the trade union, the free trade union movement opposing communism directly. Now, protesters in the city in Poland, the city of Łódź, uh, mockingly disguised their dissent by pretending that they were just casually promenading in the streets, except they all wore their hats backwards. And they all did it right at the time when President Jaruzelski was making a speech that was broadcast on the TV. So everybody was in the streets, that's back. Um, now one can add to this example um, of something um, that was the, the manner in which we practice the kind of innuendo, political innuendo. Uh, especially in the arts in Romania. And we call this kind of uh, speech, we call this kind of furtive discourse lizards. Yeah, the um, uh, right. So this was a code name for for that, yeah? Because like the reptiles, uh, they were unpredictable, undetectable, furtive, uh, quick, quick with it. Now, this took many forms in, in Romanian culture at the time. One highly esteemed type uh, consisted of, of dim, um, elusive allegories, um, such as those produced by Dan Pizza or Mircea Daniluc. These are famous uh, film directors uh, at the time. And they, these, they, they would, they would uh, fantasize about uh, dystopias. And they would present such dystopias that pointed at no concrete historical context, but they recreated the totalitarian atmosphere of oppression in a symbolic way. So, Indirectly, they were talking about comments. Lizards also came in the form of historical narratives, historical fiction that looked like it was aimed at past regimes, but actually described them in terms of that clearly applied to the communist. Um, and there's one example. I'll probably talk about it during the Q and A session. Silvio Angelescu was a professor of ours at the university who wrote this particularly interesting historical novel it was alluding to the behavior of the dictator. Now I'm going to return to, to these lizards, as we call them, uh, a bit later. So far, Scott's model seems to be working just fine. He invites us to look at the public versus the hidden transcript of discourses as the opposite ends of what was in fact the broad spectrum of social discourse. And then this way, he prompts us to notice the complexities and the tensions of such uh, discourse under oppressive regimes. However, what I fear is it's slightly misleading to look at these maneuvers as a one-way street, 
as a one-way subversion. Uh, a supposedly a strategy uh, whereby the masses successfully managed to resist domination by means of human. When I compare it to my experience of communism, I find it's over optimistic and the strategy was not entirely successful. Now let, let me explain why. We need to acknowledge, and Scott is right to a certain extent, that under communist totalitarian regimes, people have to live most of the time in a hybrid environment. And for that reason, they were forced to use a hybrid language. This meant that political humor, satire, jokes, became dangerously ambivalent, like a two-edged sword. Perhaps if a fitter image would be a sword that is pointed at both ends and has no real handle, yeah, so no safety hold for the one who manipulates you, which makes it equally deadly for them too. There's another anthropologist, David Crawford, who objected to Scott's description of this supposedly successful resistance to humor, among other things. Uh, and he argued that behind Scott's notion of, and I'm quoting Scott, the subtle mixture of outward compliance and tentative resistance. Behind that, says Crawford, lies a sobering truth. That one and the same social act can simultaneously resist and comply at the same time, right? Now this contradicts the commonplace critical imagination in a confrontation between the powerful and powerless, we are naturally inclined to look for a one-way subversion, uh, how the powerless subverts power. And we are only sensitive to that kind of thing. Um, it even, you know, even common logic to us, in a sense, prompts us, forces us to think like that. Right to think like, oh, look, you're either resisting or complying. There's no other thing. Choose. Um, but another famous writer, a Polish emigre, Czesław Milosz, who's a winner of the Nobel Prize, by the way, suggests in in a book of his, in a testimonial, uh, that we need a different kind of logic to understand what was happening. And that was uh, an ambivalent sort of uh, resistance. And when it is different logic, if we're to understand the perverse, the perplexing effects of totalitarian life on the minds of people, on yeah, the minds of people. Um, what are we talking? We're talking about the, the general population, the many yeah, out there, who were simply um, trying to cope and to survive right, under communism. This was the majority of the population that exhibited neither pure rebellion, open rebellion, because obviously you're running a huge risk had to suffer consequences, but nor were they exhibiting pure submission because that was only for the dim witness or for the sick offense. Right? I mean, the horrible thing about such a life was that in this uncertain, indecisive limbo where they lived, they were no longer able to separate in their own minds rebellion from submission because of this ambiguity. We <clears throat> we're not able to do that. I lived through that. And I think that is what made totalitarian communism, that kind of oppression, so dangerous and so damaging. Because it secretly infected the minds of free subjects with submission, while at the same time, it tolerated the illusion that dissent was possible 
if you were cunning enough to disguise it. So what I'll be proposing here is this working hypothesis that under communist totalitarianism, some forms of political humor work paradoxically both against the regime and against those who use this kind of oblique to criticize the regime. And this was done in the rhetorical mode of irony as opposed to straightforward sarcasm. Now, in most cases, theorists tend to confuse sarcasm and irony. They treat irony as a form of sarcasm. Um, so that's why I feel I, I should explain what to me is the difference between the two. Now, if you look at sarcasm, sarcasm is unequivocal. The true meaning of a sarcastic sentence is simply the contrary of what is said and is always crystal clear to us. The manner in which a sentence is uttered by the speaker or the obvious discrepancy from the situation described makes it easy to tell what the speaker really means sarcastically, which is the opposite of what he says. Sarcasm aims to deride the other by antiphrasis by replacing the right expression with its antithetical opposite. Sarcasm is an effective one-way attack, yeah. a unidirectional attack, which is meant to humiliate, or even symbolically annihilate the victim. With sarcasm, the speaker has the safe handle for his sword, so to speak. At his end, right? At the other end, there's a sharp and accurately aiming point. Irony, on the other hand, is a confounding weapon which is directed at the same time, both at the speaker and at the spoken to or spoken all. Irony implies, in most cases, that incompatible contrary versions of the truth of reality are equally valid. That they complement and even enable each other. So irony dramatizes in this ironic sentence of this one. Yeah, irony dramatizes the coincidence of contrasts yes. because it deliberately attempts to perplex us. Okay. So our habits of judgment are challenged. Our easy binaries are rendered inoperative. As the primitive, simple, either or type of logic no longer operates. The function of irony is to question any perspective, including your own, to problematize every situation and to spur reflection. Force us reconsider how we reached our conclusions, on what we ground our beliefs. Our beliefs, not just the beliefs of the other, but the others. So irony is good to help us discard prejudices and ready-made judgments. So in that sense, sarcasm is martial, warlike, where irony is meditative. And uh, Sure, irony has a long pedigree. I'm not going to go into it too, for too long. I'm just going to mention, for instance, obviously, you go back to the ancient Greece. Uh, after all, the, the word irony comes from eironeia and from the uh, uh, the character Aeron in an ancient Greek theater with a cunning dissembler, feigned humility and weakness in order to undo his <clears throat> opponent, right? you go back to Socratic irony. And even before that, you go back to pre-Socratic thinkers who use paradoxes, unsolvable paradoxes, yeah? like the paradox of movement in Zeno. Yeah? 
Heraclitus, dialectics, and so on and so forth. Uh, right? These these would be this the one of the sources, the cultural sources for uh, the modern understanding of, of irony. Um, to say nothing uh, of the similar form of uh, ironic and paradoxical statements puzzling uh, our minds that you find uh, in Christ's teachings, for instance, in the New Testament or, or in rabbinic wit. Their point seems always to be that everything may convert into its opposite and it can reach a goal if you had in what seems to be the opposite direction. Right? And there is obviously a, a huge difference between at least for a careful reader, between um, the brutal sarcasm of Pontius Pilate, for instance, yeah, his soldiers, um, you know, frowning uh, scornfully Christ with, with uh, thorns. Yeah? Uh, and on the other hand, Jesus and his ironic from a rhetorical point of view, paradoxical from a logical point of view, uh, remarks, yeah, his parables, yeah, his paradoxes, um, and you have a, a list of them there, right? For instance, when he says, according to Matthew twenty three eleven, whoever wants to be greatest should be everyone's servant. Or in Mark, you find anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. In Luke, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will keep it, and when asked why he resorts to this kind of discourse, why he resorts to paradoxes and these parables, like the parable of the prodigal son or of the adulterous woman, yeah, um, he says, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So what is implied here is that you need a different kind of understanding than the usual one, the commonplace one, yeah? The common prejudice, typical logic that you apply. And obviously there is also the um, the oriental wisdom, you know? Zen Buddhism, you, know, you have these riddles and these little anecdotes, philosophical anecdotes that are thought invoking and replacing, right? And the masters love to um, confront their disciples with, with them and saying um, two hands clapping make a sound. What is the sound of one hand clapping, for instance? Yeah, stuff like that. Okay. Um, there are also modern versions of um, and, and accounts of irony that go in the same direction of differentiating irony from sarcasm. And I'm thinking you know, of, of uh, such modern critics like I think it was like Kenneth Burke or whatever, or Paul Demont, or uh, Hayden White, uh, Linda Hutch. Yeah. Um, they're obviously, to my mind, influenced by the romantic revaluation of, of irony that we owe to Friedrich Schlegel, Carl Sold, or even to Plague's poetry. Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, Keats is um, But um, it, it becomes clear that irony works I'm giving a quote from Claire Goldberg's book on irony um, in a different way from, from sarcasm, which she calls rhetorical irony, mere rhetorical irony as opposed to philosophical. Already says, says she, there's a difference between Socratic irony, philosophical irony, platonic dialogues, and a merely rhetorical irony. Socrates, his irony is not just a substitute of one word for another. Even at its clearest, he uses irony not to say something else, the opposite, but to question the use of a concept. It does not necessarily offer another or clearly recognizable opposed meaning. Reading literature ironically requires that we think beyond the traditional philosophical commitment to propositional, translatable, non-contradictory thinking. <clears throat> Recognizing that truth is not simply there to be referred to by innocent language. With this kind of view in mind, 
we can now return to communism and political humor on the communists, where unlike sarcastic jokes, typically ironic joke invited us to reflect, to meditate on the contradictory reality that we were living, this hybrid, ambivalent reality, where language performed a two-way kind of subversion, directed both at the powerful and at the person uh, using this kind of ironic joke. And here is a second joke that I gave you that I illustrated at the beginning. <laughs> Capitalism, man exploits man, and the communism is just the other way around. So let's re remember what Claire Holbrook said, reading literature ironically is going beyond non-contradictory thinking. Recognizing the truth cannot be spoken to a person by innocent language, okay? To me, this joke is an ironic joke, not a sarcastic one, like the ones before. So rather than decide that somebody or some something is stupid or evil and call to fight, yeah, I call people to fight against this, okay? as does biting humor. This kind of joke invites us to meditate, to reflect again on any number of things you know, that is that are suggested by. It. I don't know. Perhaps meditate on how inept the communist doctrine was in praising its criticism, its beliefs. Mm. Or meditate on how silly it was of communists or anyone else to hope that they can effect real change, real social change, by merely reversing power roles, by a politic of hatred and revenge. Yeah, that's the only thing you need to do to have a good society, right? Or perhaps more generally, it invites us to meditate on whether social evils, such as exploitation, might after all be inevitable, irrespective of the political system, irrespective of your ideology. So the best you can do, perhaps, is prepare yourself for an endless fight where victories are never complete or definitive. And so, many more possible readings of this kind of joke, right? Because the joke places all of us, those who joke and those who are joked at, in this apparently hopeless situation, right? And encourages us to summon up the, the bravery, the patience, to think again right? about how we should confront inequality. Complexity, this complexity of the joke is achieved by means of linguistic effect. And drawing our attention to the devious play of language and thought by pushing our reasoning to change gears. So once we do that, what happens is we have to be prepared to face our own ignorance not just the ignorance of others, to face our own inadequacy, to face the evil in all of us and the imperfections and the sins. Let's remember now Kenneth Burke, what he has to say about irony. True irony, however, irony that really does justify the attribute of humility is not superior to the enemy. True irony, humble irony, is based upon a sense of fundamental kinship with the enemy. As one needs him, is indebted to him, is not merely outside him as an observer, but contains him, yeah, contains the enemy. Within, being consubstantial with him. So when you apply Burke to communism, yeah, you glimpse the troubling truth that when you're using ironic humor, you know, when, when they did that, the opponents of totalitarianism were entering an ambivalent 
relation with the adversities. So let's let's look at how these this human work, how these jokes worked. Okay. I'm, I'll be presenting to you jokes, yeah, a couple of jokes that that are talking about perhaps what can be the seen as the most extreme form of opposition imaginable under communist movement, which was trying to assassinate the communist leader, the supreme leader. <laughs> it is nothing more opposition. Two friends queue for food in Moscow. After many hours, one can take it no more. That's it. I've had enough of these queues. I'm going to kill that Gorbachev. And after a while, he comes back. Well, says the friend, did you do it? No, replies the other. There was an even longer queue over there. Or a desperate Romanian tells his family he'll shoot Ceausescu during one of the so-called spontaneous pro-communist rallies. Now, when the man returns after a few hours, the family asks him, did you shoot him? I couldn't, I kept missing because they were all pulling at me, asking me to shoot his wife too. <laughs> so I kept missing, right? <laughs> well, okay. Um, now, funny as they are, these jokes are, are troubling because jokes like these seem to do more than um, in more than anything else, what they seem to do is invite us to be self-reflective, self-critical in our judgments. And I hope I'm not offending anyone if I say that these jokes actually echo the mechanism behind Christ's parables, like the parable of the adulteress, right? You remember, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So what Christ suggest is first you need to be self-judging, self-critical, self-referential, uh, self-reflective, yeah? Uh, and this is a paradox, right? That he points out. When you're too headed, too, I'm sorry, too hot-headed, when you're too obsessed with judging other people, the sins of the others, your own judgmental passion, so bloodthirsty to or judging other people, punishing them. It, that just causes you to be imprecise and even unfair. So what Jesus seems to be suggesting is you first need to calibrate your judgment by applying it just as strictly to yourself, to your own sins, and compare them with the sins of the others and not find yourself so obviously superior, right? Um, and then you will realize how serious their crimes really are. Okay, so the result may be the very opposite of what Thomas Hobbes was talking about, that sudden glory, yeah, that self-righteous feeling that you're so superior to everybody else, yeah, so much more clever than others, so you know, much more right in your judgment. Okay, so in such ironic jokes, okay, the would-be assassins that try to exact popular justice fail because they're overpowered not by the force of the totalitarian regime, but by their own unbridled desire for bloody revenge. It's because of rushing impulsive to kill communist leader and he's a complex wife in the case of Romanians, that they fail so ridiculously. These jokes seem to say that you need to take some ironic distance in order to perform a thoroughly reasoned out, hopefully more successful act of resistance if you want to make society really bad. Communists were killers. If you're a killer, what's the difference? <laughs> However, these jokes are also indirectly hinting in a self-critical manner that like the bullets of the would-be assassin, the dissident irony of these jokes can't reach and destroy its targets. 
perhaps this anti-communist opposition is only half-hearted, not serious enough, enough, not serious enough if it doesn't go beyond mere joke. <clears throat> Many of the political jokes that use this ironic type of humor were in fact hiding this disquieting truth. Irony rendered the humor harmless and even turned it against the disgruntled the oppressed humorists themselves. Let's have a look at how this, this happened. Right? Certain jokes make it clear that anti-communist humor has this self-destructive effect. And here's how they work on your own mind, you know, destroying your own mind, um, which becomes contaminated by the discourse of power. Here's a, one of my favorite jokes uh, that shows how official discourse contaminates counter discourse. A Western journalist visits Romania to report on life under communism. Now, he intends to sample everyday life in Romania. But obviously, the authorities carefully orchestrate this and try to present a photoshopped <laughs> image. But at one point, he, he catches on. At one point, he has to talk to random people in the street. So he stops one man, and he starts to question that person about economy, agriculture, industry, cultural life, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, the person is very cautious because aware of secret police surveillance. So the interviewee always responds by quoting from Nikolai Ceausescu and the official documents of the doctrine. Oh, at one point, annoyed, the, the reporter stops and asks, but wait, don't you have your own opinion about such things? And the man replies falteringly, sure, I have my own opinion, but then looks around suspiciously and in a firm voice says, but I strongly disagree with it. <laughs> so um, the man who disagrees with his own opinion, it sounds like harmless ludicrous stupidity right, on the part of this average guy. But in fact, it is proof of the daily drama of communism. People were doomed to this schizoid type of mentality and behavior. Sincerity and hypocrisy did not just coexist in different corners of our minds, of our consciousness, they coincided in our minds. There's a corresponding Hungarian joke talking about the same thing that illustrates how destructive this kind of behavior is, not just for your own integrity and moral sense, but also it can do palpable damage to your fellow victims uh, under communism. The judge splits his sides with laughter. Why are you laughing, a colleague asks. Oh, I've heard this fabulous political joke. Well, let's hear it then. No way. I just sentenced a guy to three years in prison for telling me a joke. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, funny, but also chilling. Yeah. Um, it's not just comic imagination. This was reality. This, yeah. This was the, the ability of communist subjects to operate simultaneously in two modes. They could both appreciate and even identify with the oppositional witty discourse. But at the same time, they would continue to be complicit in the criminal depression of their own people. So in a sense, this is another disturbing uh, embodiment of what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil. So creating and enjoying such ironic humor is possible only as a result of this split in one's own consciousness, this psychic duplicity in our minds. What uh, may look like a clever liberation by means of this clever ironic humor may in fact have facilitated moral degradation. Minds, our language, our lives were contaminated, clouded, ultimately controlled by the dominant discourse of totalitarianism. Yet, it was the jokes themselves that were openly showing this to us 
at the same time, right? The jokes were inviting us to recognize precisely this shattering truth and to meditate on our conundrum, to try to mend our ways. So in the end, irony did remain faithful to itself. It consistently worked two ways, like a two-edged, two-pointed, yeah, double-pointed weapon. Now, in the examples just provided, official discourse infiltrates the private discourse. But there is another way, obviously. There is the other side of it, because that's the ambivalence of irony. Occasionally, it was counter discourse of anti communism against communism that would contaminate the hegemonic discourse. Most of the times, this was done surreptitiously and without the official consent. And again, remember the lizards, right? The political innuendo that was somehow uh, bypassing the vigilance of censorship. Of communism. However, some some other times, and I find this more interesting, even the communist authorities themselves tolerated these little innocuous lizards. This happened, for instance, in satirical skits that were part of popular entertainment shows on TV, radio, right? Some humor criticized excessive bureaucracy and minor flaws, minor defects in everyday life. And that was approved by the censors because they were hoping, presumably, to deflect attention from the bigger damage done by communism, and from the structure of flaws in communist society. Satire was meant to find fault most of the times with the lesser representatives, uh, the lesser officials of the regime, never with the higher, ones, yeah? never with high dignitaries or the leaders, the top leaders. Negative characters were played by well loved, talented comedians. So, what could have been a genuine criticism of the establishment? turned into a merely pleasant moment when you have seen, had a good man, one moment. So contestation turned quietly into conformity and acceptance. And in one particular skit, such skit, it was the very term lizard. The term itself is coded term of anti-communism that was appropriated officially by this type of settlement. Now, in 1969, one of the most respected and talented comedians, Tomakarachiu, performed a satirical monologue called The Man with the Whisper. Now, in this case, the idiom of that skills, the idiom of party authorized satire, incorporated this coded idiom of counter discourse, this word, lizard. Now, at the time we witnessed this, I was very young at the time, but, but parents, uh, and when I, I'm looking at it again, yeah, everybody was, was really amazed at the insane courage to use this term on public television, on the communism, right? Uh, and it was not just that, but the way in which Tomar Karaji, the actor, delivered this monologue, suggesting, you, you can see him looking around his shoulder, yeah? He was suggesting the, uh, obviously, the, the constant surveillance, yeah, the secret police, the snitches, uh, in his acting, right? Uh, however, he was performing a mono where the term lizard was used with an entirely 
than the one we ascribe to the two. Okay. Instead of referring to this covert resistance to communism, lizard was made to mean in this case, slandering and backstabbing your peers. You know, snitching on them for personal gain, personal advancement, okay? and uh, even a mock genealogy was provided for this claiming that lizards were typically the weapon of scheming people like Cardinal Mazarin, uh, Iago, the Borgia family. And so using lizards was presented as something reprehensible, dastardly behavior, rather than courageous act of resistance. Yeah? So it was meant to undermine the solidarity between people to erode that horizontal solidarity because it worked horizontally against your peers rather than vertically up the hierarchy against the leaders. But the ironic equivocation is nevertheless there. But as you, as I said, activists get with deliberate ambiguity, suggesting the tension in this script between the public and the private discourse. At a textual level, he seemed to speak about immoral individuals, slur and malign peers to ingratiate themselves with their bosses, but his conspiratorial tone and his cautious glance and sideways huh, suggested the insecure, dangerous environment, yeah, the terror, psychological terror caused by the secret police. So on the one hand, Karaji was secretly winking at the public about known everyday practices. And on the other hand, he was playing along in this official maneuver to counter subvert the subversion of communism. Now, most analysis of, of this kind of humor, yeah, political humor, especially under totalitarianism, I think failed to register. The main function of this type of humor is not to typically invoke resistance, uh, relief. I think the main function of this type of humor is to prompt, to provoke reflection on this tense ambivalence of the language we're using, the lives we are leading those days. And so it works by equivocation. Totalitarianism created a space of generalized hypocrisy and lies, of propaganda, brainwashing. It also punished direct criticism. So um, as a result, if you wanted to reflect in any way real facts, real opinions, you have to frame this in an ambivalent space in order for this discourse to go on. Ironic words and actions work therefore two opposite directions. They served and undermined at the same time both the communist regime and people who resisted. It was a two-way sword. The regime on one hand accepted it, tolerated it, because it was trying to pose as capable of wit, capable of irony itself. And it was also aiming to overturn the irony of their opponents. But in doing so, the regime was also allowing, was owning up to its imperfections. It's owning up to the existence of opposition in the regime. Otherwise, not a set system, right? So it was acknowledging the weapons of the weak, and so implicitly it validated. On the other hand, the resisting individuals felt more at ease to use counter discourse publicly if it was ironic, ambiguous, and But uh, the irony was defused. 
made harmless. So was their opposition. It forces them to accept censorship and work with it, to adopt fragments of the official idiom, which ultimately turned them into unwitting collateral things. I bet this kind of picture is not easy to accept. Definitely wasn't easy to live with. Live with. Living with ambiguity, with indecisive language, no pickle. And I bet you might expect at the end of this talk for me to provide some sort of definitive conclusion <laughs> to this talk. Uh, but since I want you to get a picture, a real sense of what it meant to live like this, I won't. Uh, and in, in true conscience, I don't think I even could if I tried. Because that's what irony is. Irony right? is perplexing, it makes us reflect, yeah, and find that nothing is a definite answer. Not even reflecting that nothing is a definitive answer can be a definite answer. Right? So um, some form of action is ultimately needed. Right? After all, however, not without the reflection that is prompted by it. So I'm inviting you to think by yourselves how dictators, how illiberal, abusive rulers react to humor in your own culture, maybe in the past of your cultures, uh, or even today in your own culture. Yeah. Because the uh, subject of such rulers, such uh, intolerant regimes, is still unfortunately so topical today. Yeah, I mean, take for instance Putin, right, who is renowned for his keen sense of humor. <laughs> you, you recognize he's just Sarkis. Yeah. <laughs> what did Putin do when confronted with irony? He curtly and intolerantly shut down any kind of ironic protest, like the, the famous toy protests in, in Siberia. You know, people were, um, you know, human protests were banned. So therefore what people did was they used little toys, you know, like the Kinder the Surprise, uh, yeah, or uh, yeah, the, the Lego figurines, yeah? They used those and planted little protest signs on them and put them in the snow. Yeah. And then the, the next day, the uh, Siberian authorities passed a, a local uh, ordinance saying that toy protests were forbidden, <laughs> which made them look ridiculous, obviously. <laughs> and yet, this is how some of the intolerant, yeah. Um, rulers react to this kind of humor and damage their own image and reputation, at least to a certain extent, right? Um, same thing with the famous puppet show, yeah? Kukli. Yeah. In, in, it started in the, in the glasnost years and continued for, for some time until Putin yeah, became president of Russia. Stopped it, right? Because he was one of the most favorite subjects for humor there. Yeah. So you can think of Putin, obviously. But this may ring a bell even here in the United States. Yeah. Here, some presidents at least participate in their own roast or in comedic impersonations uh, of themselves. Like the White House Correspondents Association dinner, for instance, yeah, uh, and uh, they accept being the butt of uh, satire, or even roast themselves. Yet others don't, although they may engage in rude and uh, heavy-handed jokes at the expense of their adversaries. Um, yeah, so to return to my example in the beginning, how successful would have been witty 2017 protests in Romania 
if they haven't been backed up by massive rallies out into the streets, hundreds of thousands of people. How potent is this laughtivism? Someone suggested the term uh, activism by means of laughter. Yeah. Without good old fashioned civic and political action. Or vice versa. How good is that without human, without wit? We may also want to meditate how dangerous it is to make fun of toxic political rulers and then just pat yourself on the back for having proved that you're such an intelligent person, and such a witty person. How toxic is it to just get drunk in your armchair on what Hobbes called the sudden glory that comes from comparing yourself to despicable politicians? To find out, surprise, that you're so superior, so moral, right? So smart. And then just doze off at the channel. Yeah? Do I have a clear answer to that? Do I have my own definitive opinion about that? I don't think I do. Or perhaps I do, but I strongly disagree with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so very much. I cannot imagine a more thoughtful and insightful and relevant lecture to kick off this series in honor of Dr. Nguyen's parents. So thank you again for everything. I, I know that somewhere her spirit is smiling, um, knowing that her legacy and dedication to political rhetoric is continuing. Thank you. It's awesome to be here. Thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to. Um, we can probably field a few right now, but if you know people, I know that there are some students need to run to classes. Um, you may do that, but please feel free to ask a few questions, you know, out loud, or you can um, kind of corner him here. But also, I do want to point out. Um, that Dr. David Williams and his colleagues, who I believe are both online, are dedicating the third edition of their book. David, you, you quickly give a shout out to the book that you're dedicating to Dr. Marin. Uh, along with uh, Drs. Michael Launer and Marilyn Young, who wrote Zoom uh, and it's in the Florida State, we've done four volumes, uh, three of which are now in publication on the rhetorical rise and demise of democracy in Russian political discourse, not on the ground, but in how they talk about it. Uh, the third volume we were finishing for the summer uh, with Noe and Doc. And she had participated at several of those projects with us. In the third volume are a couple of the authored essays uh, with Noemi that will be in that. So we dedicated the third volume to Noemi. Um, and if, uh, when the volume arrives here, uh, that would be available. It's another wonderful way to continue her legacy. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So I, I kind of want to put this in our local context, or at least the American yeah. American context. Um, do you see irony as a potential insulator for criticism in regards to our political system? When you talk about the White House correspondent dinner, is that a way in which we are sort of falsely allow ourselves to believe we can criticize a system, but we are subvertly criticizing the parts they allow us to criticize in these capacities? So simple answer, is it? <laughs> right? Because uh, again, um, there are there are opposite. Um, theories about hypothesis about political humor uh, and, and resisting through political humor. You know, the components of leftivism are saying it's it's a good thing, it works against political power and oppression. Uh, other people are saying you're getting drunk on water. It, it doesn't work at all. Right? They don't care. They're shameless. They're ruthless. Right? Now, in your particular context, it all depends on who's in power, right? Um, and obviously, you have this ability to still, even when it's not such a venue as, as that dinner, right? 
um, and even if the, the 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 rulers do not participate, do not accept, right, do not embrace this as as a justified form of of, of expressing opinions, um, you can still express your opinion elsewhere using other media channels, right? which is which is good. But there's a danger there, right? There's a danger that unless you use that to actually prompt some form of action, you stop there and say, okay, we've done our bit. Now let's wait for them to miraculously change course, <laughs> right? And listen to what we have to say, right? Some of the times that's just now. It's more of that Hobbesian frame irony. Yeah, yeah, but I think they go together, right? I think, I think from from the first day that we learn how to walk, we need to learn how to balance things and balance ourselves. Right? We need to balance humor with with action. Right? They don't work in separation. That's that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of Andre Perkov? I, I, I'm not an expert yeah, in, in that particular field. I'm, I simply share the Romanian experience that I have. I, I found examples from Eastern Europe at the time, but I am I'm not a specialist. And so I, I won't venture an opinion of that sort. Yours is as good as mine. Then I will ask you about the election. No. <laughs> well, this isn't a question, but my observation is everything that most everything that you talked about, it was a little bit too creepy how we could apply it to what's happening here today. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, not just here. You know, throughout All Europe. Over. All over. Throughout yeah. Europe. Experiencing this. Okay. Yeah. Well, more observations I've seen. Then uh, the second one is a, is a question. So I think uh, probably the most prominent uh, American anthropologist of, uh, of Romania, uh, Gatman Verdri, got into trouble with Securitate with the Romanian authorities because of the humor, and she thought that Tabu was uh, studying the socialist economy, uh, farming, but uh, and she ventured into the nationality qu question and then put into the. Uh, I guess uh, prologue of the book, uh, an ethnic joke about the you know Transylvanian Germans, Hungarians, and Romanians, uh, thinking that nobody was I guess better off than the uh, other, and uh, immediately was a, a red flag. So it was kind of interesting to to see an outsider venturing into humor and getting into trouble yeah. uh, there. Another question, I think it's uh, bigger for me. It's probably less relevant for for the talk, but do you see the relevance? Uh, of uh, Central East, uh, Eastern Central Europe as a separate unit, because I think there is a lot of questioning of this both within the region and outside. Uh, that uh, you know many Europeans are essentially want or are uh, they pretend or are uh, thinking that they're integral part of the uh, West and the uh, communist pre communist legacy does not matter. And uh, the same seems to be uh, the case here from the uh, I guess uh, from uh, from outside that okay. It's irrelevant anymore. It's you know they're either part of the West or falling behind to the uh, develop, uh, developing world. So what would you guess the Romanian take on this? Well, listen, um, I'm a humanist, and therefore um, I tend to look more at the subjective factors rather than the hard evidence of things. Is Eastern and Central Europe uh, diff something different? How else would we explain the fact that countries like Poland and Hungary, for instance, who were immediately embraced by Western Europe and immediately accepted in the European Union, right? Who were um, ahead of Romania, definitely, in you know by any criteria. Right, in terms of uh, economy, in terms of democracy, uh, institutions, yeah, anything. How do you explain that these countries all of a sudden went back? Yeah, yeah, well, the, this backsliding. How do you explain it? 
right? They weren't doing worse than Romania or any other country, yeah? They were doing okay, right, economically. They, they were uh, respected in, uh, in the European Union, okay? My explanation to that has always been, not as a specialist, but someone who comes from the field that I'm studying, my explanation has been that they, they haven't yet gotten rid of the psychological effect of communism, the shame Right, the uh, being treated as a backward part of Europe, right? You, you, you know, Larry Wolf inventing Eastern Europe talks about how uh, Western Europe invented Eastern Europe as its backward, yeah, half uh, savage counterpart in Europe, right? And that had stuck with us from the Enlightenment when it came up, yeah, in the discourse of these. Um, armchair geographers and philosophers, yeah, Voltaire and Rousseau, and, yeah, <laughs> who would talk about Eastern Europe in this kind of fashion, uh, it stuck with us, yeah, throughout yeah, the, the 20th century. And still, you know, when you look at the way um, Eastern European immigrants are seen in the West, yeah, are treated by Western countries, yeah. They feel constantly like they're second-rate European citizens, and yeah? they're looked down upon. And that is a frustration that gnaws at their yeah, uh, peace of mind and that troubles them constantly, okay? So they jumped at any spark, <laughs> yeah? and they, that, that ignited their frustration. Yeah. And their anti-European, anti-democratic views, right? Because they associate that with the West. They associate that with the people who offend them, insult them constantly, right? So I think that's why there is such a, a popular support for these illiberal governments in these countries. Yeah? And why you have, why they fall for the easy, you know, narratives like, ooh, the immigrants in our country, what immigrants? It's not a big threat. They're not going for Hungary and Poland, they're going for Germany, right? The, the northern countries, you know, Britain, France, right? There's no big danger there, so on and so forth, right? So uh, I think that these, this is what makes Eastern Europe, you know, former communist countries, they, they, they are a different thing. And when they, when Western Europe does not factor that in, that psychological yeah, frustration in, this is what can happen. But there's hope. Yeah, the Poland's yeah, the prime minister. Maybe, maybe. So it's just like similar to the effect of post-colonial countries in terms of the way they... Not to stretch, but <laughs> did you did not stretching it with me? <laughs> You've heard the presentation. I teach post communist, post colonialism, right? Comparative cultural studies of that, sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering if in your research, <laughs> I was wondering if in your research you encountered uh, moments of uh, the government using humor against humor. Right? Because I come from a from a context that's currently like socialist slash communist, right? And I see this happening all the time. Like, you know, I'm, I come from Venezuela, so the president says something ridiculous and he gets ri ridiculed. So then the president decides, oh, I'm going to make a jingle out of this and okay. use it for my campaign, yeah. right? So almost as if to use humor against the political opposition. So I wonder in the Romanian context that you that you analyze, if there was any type of presidential humor being used as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Not in the official statements, definitely, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, rulers do engage in that. And the elite, the political elite, mm -hmm. does does that quite a lot. There's a lot of definitely. There's a lot of of uh, humor, uh, humorous uh, back and forth in in the parliament. Uh, but um, 
they they often come on TV and talk shows and they they um, they do their little jokes. What is typical of such jokes? You know, again, it, the political elite in, in Romania has been compromised almost entirely. There is no hope left if you're looking at the present day situation there. What happened was the political parties in Romania decided to run a cartel, a political cartel, right? So imagine this situation here in America, right? The Democrats and the Republicans all of a sudden think, you know what, why waste our energies and resources on fighting each other? Let's have an agreement. <laughs> let's, you know, let's rule, you know, take, take turns in ruling. Let's share power, yeah, and stop this nonsense. Yeah, elections, political debates, and what is this? Stop it, okay? This is what happened in Romania. Yeah. You had the two main parties that were fighting and they had a chance, yeah, the major parties, struck a deal, right? So they now govern together. And they have what in, in chess we call the castle, right? You change positions. Right. Say so. For the next uh, year, you're gonna be nominating the uh, prime minister, yeah. And then we will take our turn, and yeah, we'll govern like that. Okay. So with this kind, and and therefore there is no real opposition to them, political opposition. Okay. Secondly, you have to understand that this kind of politician is not there because they're. Uh, competent, <laughs> well trained, and clever. No, no, these these are incredibly ignorant people, yeah? crude people who just amass money and they're useful for the party. Okay, so you can expect that kind of behavior from them. So when when you're making this, uh, you, you're making a joke and you're witty about them. They don't care. Yeah. They either don't get it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. or they don't care, yeah. Yeah. or they're shameless. Yeah? yeah, and they will say so what? Yeah, yeah. I don't mind accepting. Yeah, plagiarism, right, is a plague among Romanian politics. They somehow want to have PhDs, <laughs> so they plagiarize. Yeah, or they ask someone else to write their PhD. Okay, <laughs> and they're found out. Okay, so what they say? Well, it's not a big deal. Come but on, guys. What is right. it? Yeah. 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 Oh, I so I didn't know the, the exact rules for quoting. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> so. No yeah. Last words. yeah. And I was going to say really quickly, um, Diana, I can't read her last name up there. Uh, Marganescu, perhaps. Um. Can someone read that? That can actually read. I, can't read it. I, can't, it's, I know my uh, aging eye. <laughs> okay, sorry, somebody's reading. His, can you go ahead and read it for us? Yeah. Please. Is it out loud? Yes, loud. Uh, as Hannah Rand also noted in her origins of totalitarianism, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and nothing was true. Humor was equal to mental survival under communism. True. Yeah. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yes. It was coping, as I said, it was coping with it. Yeah. yeah. Survival. Yeah. But just that. Yeah. You have to think of, of it in, in terms of surviving alone on an island when you're shipwrecked, as opposed to having a comfortable life in your own home. But yeah. when you tell That's the us, difference. When you tell those jokes to each other, it's a way of identifying yeah. with, like, oh, this is another person that agrees with right so that they're you kind wouldn't of like be daring to test that well no you would only say that well, to people you've already right, i guess you have to already know yeah. how that person feels. oh yeah yeah and then i think we have, have time yeah and i think we have one last time uh for a question from 
Phil Trapani, and then we actually have a couple of students waiting to get pictures of the video. Yeah, well, no, Phil. Uh, yeah, I think we've already gone way over, so I'll just say thank you. Uh, I, you know, knowing Noemi the way that I think a lot of us did, I, I absolutely understand why the two of you were such close companions and collaborators, and we say thank you for the work that you're doing. I think that uh, she would be really happy to have to know this was happening. So thank you for that. And I'll just let people have conversations and talk. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like I said, I know I have a few students who have been uh, chomping at the bit to chat with you and yeah, let them see say hello. Hi, thank you to everybody who came online as well. Thank you. I don't think I literally oh. was ever going to see you again. I've been on campus and on campus.